Hello and welcome to River City Online.
Hello and welcome to River City Online. We're excited to have you join us today. As we get started, please take a moment and say hi. Hi. In the chat and let us know that you're here. We anticipate that we will experience God's presence today as we worship together. Feel free to connect to your host or ask for prayer at any time during the service. And you have a great day.
Hey everybody, Pastor Kevin here. Thanks for joining us online today. We're looking at Exodus 5 to 12, a big chunk. I wanna encourage you to read it this week. Uh, we, last week we talked about Moses and that burning bush experience and God calling him to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, let my people go. And so that's the title of today's message, part eight in the series of God's Big Story. Very sh excited to share this with you. And it's such an amazing story. And before I, before I go into the story and look at the scripture, I got a lot of scripture for you today, is this, I was, I was talking to somebody recently and they were saying that they had, been, they had visited someone's home and we're just really saddened by the condition that these people were living in. Uh, they said, literally, Kevin, there was, there was toddlers, there was feces on the floor uh, that they were just ignoring, uh, and it just, they were just living in squalor. And this person said to me, I just can't see it. I just don't understand how they can do that. That's an extreme example, but I, I was thinking about that, that even, in our own lives, we, we tolerate uh, our dysfunction. What becomes normal can be really awful. <laughs> and and, and I, I link that to today's message because the people of Israel, uh, when they came into the land of Egypt, they, Pharaoh opened arms, gave them the best plot of land in Goshen, uh, for their flocks, it was incredible. And really they had about 200 years in Egypt that was prosperous, they multiplied. It was incredible, it was really a pretty good situation. But then another, then a you know, new, new leadership, new Pharaoh forgot about uh, Joseph, forgot about all the influence there. And this new Pharaoh, he is threatened by the people of Israel and a series of other leaders, but that basically it gets to the point where the last 230 years of their time in Egypt, they're enslaved. They're, and we're, here, we're now at, fast forwarding here to 430 years uh, in Egypt, over half of those enslaved. And the people have had so many generations have gone by where they're enslaved that for years and years and years, they didn't cry out to God. They didn't cry out to God, but they start to cry out to God. They get so desperate in their slavery, so desperate in their dysfunction, so desperate in their bondage that they cry out and go, God, are you there? Help us, help us. And it's this place that we read even last week that this is where God responds to those cries for help, cries for freedom and goes to Moses and says, Moses, you've been in the wilderness for 40 years. You've been in the desert for 40 years. I think you're ready, Moses. You're ready to be the one who goes and sets, uh, leads the people out of Egypt. You're gonna go talk to Pharaoh and you're gonna go let him know, let my people go. So, uh, it's, so let's look at uh, chapter five, Moses, in chapter five, Moses and Aaron, uh, before we actually look at the scripture, I just want to give you a little summation and then we'll read a few, we'll read a few verses. We're just going to be highlighting kind of mountaintops across the, these, uh, these four or five chapters here. Okay. So in chapter five, Moses and Aaron, they go and they speak with the people of Israel that are enslaved and they go to them, go, go back to Egypt and they, they go to Egypt and they say, Hey, we, uh, God wants you to be free. He's heard your cry. He wants you to be free. And, and so he, I'm going to go to Pharaoh and I'm going to say, let God's people go. God is asking for his people to be released, release them. Now, anyway, so he does that. He goes, Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, I don't know who God is. I don't know who you are. I don't care. I'm not letting them go. No way. Actually, he cramps, <laughs> clamps rather, not cramps, clamps down on them even harder. And they, uh, it gets worse for the people of Israel. Their, their, the brutality increases. They give them less supplies, demand more in their quotas every day. It's bad. And, and they get, dis people get discouraged. They're like, what? Well, God's not doing anything. He's not moving. He, I thought you said he was going to deliver us. It's not happening. And in verse 22 and 23 of Exodus 5, it says, Then Moses went back to the Lord and protested. He said, Why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why did you send me, Lord? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he has been even more brutal. Speaking of Pharaoh, Pharaoh has been even more brutal to your people, and you have done nothing to rescue them. So Moses is frustrated. The people are frustrated. And, but listen, <laughs> God's timing, as I mentioned last week, is, is a lot of times a mystery. 
right? A lot of times a mystery, but God knows what it takes for his plan to be accomplished. And so we got to trust him in this, but God, because he promises deliverance, right? And Moses goes and tells him. And so I, I want to give you my first point for today. I've got, I can't remember, probably three or four. I think about four. Uh, here's the first one. God's love promises deliverance. God has already promised deliverance. He's let the people of Israel know. He said to Moses, let them know. I, it's going to happen. It's just the timing. But they're discouraged. They're hopeless feeling right now. But God's love. God loves them so much, you guys. God loves us so much that he won't let us stay trapped in our dysfunction. He won't. He offers the ultimate way out. And we're going to get more to that here in just a second. So let's look at Exodus 6, 6 to 7, as we fast forward to chapter 6. This is what he says. He says, therefore, say to the people of Israel, this is what he says to Moses, go and say this, he says, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. He gets really specific here. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Do you see how he's just... Oh, I love this. It says, then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. That chunk in Exodus 6 is so beautiful. Leave that on the screen if you would. It says, I'm going to free you from your oppression. I, so I know you're oppressed. I know you need rescuing. I know you're in slavery. I will do this and I'll redeem you. I, I'm powerful enough. Pharaoh thinks he's powerful. He's not powerful, more powerful than me. It's going to require some great acts of judgment, right? So he's seeding these plagues that are going to come to get Pharaoh to loosen up his hand and for really for the people to trust and believe him. I'll claim you as my own people. So he's, he's saying, you, you're my people. I know you don't even remember that. You don't even remember that there's promises for you. Reflect, think back. It's been hundreds of years, generations and generations. Then you'll know that I'm the Lord, your God, who has freed you. God's doing this in such a way that the people will know that it's God, that it's God, that it's not Moses, that it's God, that it's not them, it's God. And that's the thing, you guys, when we, when God frees us from our dysfunction, from our sin, from our stuff that we wrestle and struggle with, he loves to do it in such a way that he gets the credit because he's the one who deserves the credit. Yes. All right. So God's love promises deliverance. Um, and so then what happens is we fast forward a little bit and it's here that, that Pharaoh, Moses and Aaron go back before Pharaoh and, and they're let my people go that they can worship God. And he's going to take a series of 10 uh, plagues, 10 things and, and a series of back and forth and back and forth. And the first one is he turns water into blood and, and he goes, he said, all the Nile's going to turn into blood and, and the fish are all going to die. And then he goes back to, he, he says this to Pharaoh and Pharaoh's kind of like, just ignores him, said, I'm not letting him go goes back. He's like, uh, you know, he's frustrated, but doesn't, doesn't change. Brings the second one, the frogs. And this is all very detailed out and you go back and read it. All right. And then, then a plague of frogs, frogs everywhere, frogs in the bed, frogs in the, in your kneading bowl. It says, as a matter of fact, Exodus eight, two to three says, if you refuse to let them go, Pharaoh, I will send a plague of frogs across your land. The Nile river will swarm with frogs. They will come up out of the river and into your palace, even into your bedroom and onto your bed. They will enter the houses of your officials and your people. They will even jump into your ovens and your kneading bowls. I mean, that's descriptive. Wow. It's, Frogs everywhere. I don't know about you, but that is a hopping bad time. Okay, no pun intended. I'm not trying to get you to croak or anything. Okay, just tune in. All right, third plague happens here. It's a plague of gnats. Ugh. If you live in the LC Valley, there's that time of year where the gnats come out and they're just everywhere. And I used to ride my bike a lot. And when I ride my bike and the gnats get in your eyes and your teeth and your face, and, and that's nothing. This was like, it, they said it was like, like the dust of the ground. Gnats were like the dust. It was just everywhere, just everywhere. Anyway, that, that doesn't, that doesn't stop Pharaoh. Pharaoh's like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, no, that's not enough. Let my people go. Moses says, nope, nope, not doing it. Ah, uh, fourth one swarms of flies ah, and still nothing. I mean, it's like the stubborn heart and it does say God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it, you know? And so that's interesting in there. Maybe you're going to see that when you read through it, that God's, God's hardening Pharaoh's heart or he's letting the hardness of Pharaoh's heart just be manifest in this situation. But 
it's a stubborn man, it's a stubborn leader, it's someone who thought he was God, and obviously is being confronted by the real God. Ah, so in Exodus 8.20 it says this, in the passage about the flies, it says, say to him, this is what the Lord says, Moses says, to say to Pharaoh again, let my people go so they can worship me. Listen, when God's freeing us up, he's not just freeing us up into nothing. He's freeing us up so that we can worship him and be in relationship with him. And that's what God was doing with the people of Israel. He's like, I, I'm freeing you up so that you can worship me. That's what you were designed for. That's what you were made for. People of Israel, you haven't, you haven't worshiped me like you were designed to. <sighs> You get to, I, I'm gonna free you up so you can, but they're so oppressed, so discouraged, so bound that they, they just, they weren't worshiping him. They cried out to him. But just so you know, when God frees us, he's not freeing us just to nothing. He's freeing us into a place of worship and relationship with him. And I just was reminded that, that uh, in Mark 11, 15 to 17, I won't read you the passage, but you could read it later. This is the passage where Jesus is at the temple and, and he, he gets angry, it says, the scripture says, Jesus gets angry and turns over the tables of the money changers and the vendors that were selling sacrifices and inflating the prices. And they were extorting the worshipers there who had come to worship God. And you might go, why did, does that mean God's just mad at people if they sell something uh, in church or in the house of God? I don't think that's what it is at all. I think what's happening here is he's saying, these people, these money changers in the temple had gotten so, full, they were constricting, they were restricting people, uh, distracting people from worshiping God. And their distraction became a hindrance to people worshiping God and that's what got Jesus upset. He's like, I've got to rid this temple of all these distractions because people are coming here to worship God. And no different here, if we go back to Exodus, no different, God's like, Listen, there's a massive distraction from you working, uh, rather worshiping God. It's called slavery. It's called being oppressed and so bound for 230 years that it took that long for you to awaken enough to go, wait a minute, maybe there's something better. I remember God. Uh, let's cry out to him. God, help us, help us, help us. And they do. And then go down to verse 21 and 22 if you're reading the scripture. It's on the screen. But if you have your Bible open, it's Exodus 8, 21 to 22. It says this, If you refuse, then I will send swarms of flies on you, your officials, your people, and all the houses, the Egyptian homes, will be filled with flies. Oy, this is yucky. And the ground will be covered with them. But this time I spare the region of Goshen. I, 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 I left this in here because I wanted you to see that what happens here is, is there's a distinction. When he goes to Pharaoh, he's like, listen, the swarm of flies is going to come, but I'm going to spare the land of Goshen. In other words, Goshen was where the people of Israel were in Egypt. They, they were in this beautiful land. But up till this point, the plagues had impacted everybody. But now it's like with the flies, he's making a distinction. Listen, I want you to know, Pharaoh, that this, is, this fly thing is going to impact everybody, but it's not going to impact the pe my people who I'm saying, let them go. They are my people, they're my special people and I'm asking you and I want you to see that I'm upon, I, I'm doing this and, and I'm not gonna let them be touched by this. So look at it says verse 22, but this time I will spare the region of Goshen where my people live. No flies uh, will be found there. Then you will know that I'm the Lord and that I am present even in the heart of your land. Pharaoh, you think you're over this land, you think you're the God of this land, but I'm here too. And I'm gonna spare the people of this fly thing. Uh, it doesn't persuade him. He's like, keeps, no, 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 Ver, number five plague, livestock, horses, donkeys, cattle, camels, boom, gone, wiped out. Pharaoh doesn't let the people go. Nope, not gonna do it. He's, he's starting to, to get worn down a bit, but his stubborn heart, Ah, then it's boils in number six, festering skin disease, nothing. Then it's hail in number seven, massive stones of hail and, and the lands left in ruins. Then it's locusts and whatever remained after the hail, the locusts came and ate that up. It just, it just, you know, when you think about it, any one of these things would be terrible, but now we're at number eight and it's, oh, so bad. And excuse me, and Pharaoh has a moment he has a moment 
And, and he kind of pulls back a little bit in verse 16 of chapter 10. It says, Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron after the locusts, after the hail. And the livestock are gone and the boils have come and the hail comes and the locust comes. And Pharaoh quickly summons Moses and Aaron and says, I've sinned against the Lord your God and against you. He actually admits that he sinned against the Lord and against you. He admits there is a Lord, Lord God. And, and he says, I've sinned against him. And he says, and he confesses this, which is amazing. Then verse 17, forgive my sin just this once. <laughs> forgive my sin just this once and plead with the Lord your God to take away this death from me. So it's, it's gotten bad and he's, he's right close. But then it says he... Uh, he still doesn't let him go. Number uh, the ninth plague, a plague of darkness over every part of the land. It says they couldn't even see each other. Verse 23 of chapter 10, during all that time, the people could not see each other and no one, and no one moved. Everybody went still because it was just so, it was so thick. They couldn't see each other. But look what it said. But there, look what it says. But there was light as usual where the people of Israel lived. So Goshen, full light, normal. <laughs> Rest of the land, total, utter thick black darkness. Wow. So we, uh, that's a lot. That's, there's a lot there. That's nine of the plagues, but we get to this final one. It's the final blow. It's the, it's the breaking point uh, of the shackles of Pharaoh. And, and, uh, you know, every time God sends Moses back, Moses Aaron back says, let, give him the opportunity to let my people go. No, 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 no. And in Exodus 11, the tenth plague comes, and it's the, it's the peak of the, of the awfulness, and um, you know, trying to get Pharaoh to 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 release the people, and um, he says, "I'm going to kill. Or I'm going to all your firstborn sons will die, even the firstborn of your livestock." And that's what happens. And that's what happens. And Pharaoh, this this loud cry is going to echo through all of Egypt, but. <laughs> God makes a way for the people of Israel to not have to be impacted by this last plague, this 10th plague as well as he, as he had spared them from many of these plagues. He gets to this final one, this final blow to Pharaoh. It's the tipping point of freedom, uh, the freedom uh, mission of you know, freedom from slavery. And what God does, and it's my next point, is that God's love provides a substitute. God's love provides a substitute. Look at verse 7 of Exodus 12. We're now in, mostly going to be in 12. It says, then they're to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. So, so Mero, or rather, Moses is, instructs the people, says, God wants you to uh, get, a, get a lamb, get a perfect lamb, get a beautiful lamb and, you know, and, and kill it. And uh, you can eat, eat the lamb, but I want you to take the blood and I want you to apply blood to the top of the door and to the sides of the door and do this on your houses. And when you do this, uh, I will pass over. When, when that death angel comes across and, and your, your, your firstborn will be spared. This is what I, you do. You, the lamb will be the substitute. And so Exodus 13, 14 of chapter 12 says this. The blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign marking the houses where you're staying. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is a day to remember each year from generation to generation. You must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. Isn't that an amazing thing he does here, God does here. He says, yeah, and, and he says, this is, this is going to be that provision for you. It's a substitute. And I want you to remember this from generation to generation. And that's where the festival of Passover comes, the feast of Passover. Uh, it, it is the remembrance of this, this salvation from this substitute provided uh, at, at, during the season in the, in the Exodus story. And I think what's fascinating here is that in John, a couple, a couple verses from the New Testament, John 1.29 um, says this, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus says, I am the Lamb of God. I am the Lamb, rather. Isn't that awesome? That, do you see the connection? Because one of the things we want to do in this series is help you to see the whispers of Jesus and and the sightings of Jesus and how everything in scripture points to Jesus. Well, here it's just so clear that Jesus calls himself the lamb. 
Uh, this was a lamb that got provided here, uh, an incredible connection. And then also, I think it's interesting that, that Jesus calls himself the door. Look at John 10, 9 to 10. It says, I am the door. If anyone enters me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus is saying, not only am I the Lamb of God, I'm, I'm the door. And when I reflect on Exodus, as we just mentioned, what did they do? They, uh, God instructs them, put the blood of the Lamb on the door. And when you go in the house, in Christ, you will be safe. You will be safe. Beautiful. Exodus 12, 30. Fast forward to that, down, in, down to verse 30. It says, Pharaoh and all his officials and all the people of it, of Egypt woke up during the night and the loud wailing was heard throughout the land. I just can't imagine that. I can't imagine the chaos. I can't imagine the grieving. I can't imagine the screams of terror. And it says even that, that Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh, he, his son, his firstborn, his eldest son died. And it says screams, you know, went out. It says there was not a single house where someone had not died except for those in the land of Goshen, <laughs> except for the people of Israel, the people who applied the blood to their door, just as instructed. Verse 31 says, Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night. Pharaoh's like, get those guys over here. And he says, get out, get out. He ordered them. He said, leave my people and take the rest of the Israelites with you. Go and worship the Lord as you have requested. He'd had enough. He'd hit, the, he'd hit the end of himself, we think. <laughs> but he'd hit the point where he's like, okay, they can go. I mean, he was losing 1.5 to 2 million people, roughly, that were his slaves, that were his workers, that were doing all the work. And, you know, from a pure uh, awful evil standpoint, power standpoint, you can see why Pharaoh didn't want to let them go. These are hardworking. There's millions of them. Why would we not want to keep them? But he's, he's resistant this whole time. But man, talk about a difficult journey. And then as we keep going in chapter 12, and here's my next point, is that God's love meets our needs. God's love meets our needs. <laughs> Look at verse 35 and 36. I just think this is so fascinating what God does here. Okay, lean in. It says, and the people of Israel did as Moses had instructed. Okay, great. They asked the Egyptians uh, for clothing and articles of silver. So the, the people of Israel go to their neighbors, the Egyptian neighbors, and it says, ask them for clothing, for articles of silver and gold. In verse 36, the Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites, and they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. And it says, so they stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. And I think I, if you haven't read that in a while, it may, it's an easy thing to overlook because the people were, they didn't have anything. They had bare bones minimum. They were slaves. They were living in squalor. They were living in a depleted, awful, there was no wealth for them. They were slaves. But God knew they needed provision. God knew what they needed. And he's like, okay, <laughs> it, it, he, Go to, the, go to the Egyptian neighbors and ask them for what you need. Clothes, money, uh, physical provision. God's not only going to provide for you and I spiritually, he will provide for us physically. Isn't that beautiful? He takes care of our needs. And right here, it just shows it right back here in Exodus. Uh, he knew they needed to leave with, with enough to, for, as they go into this next phase and next season, they're going to need some things, <laughs> right? And he provides it through the people that are there. And I, I just fast forward to the New Testament for a second. Second Corinthians 9, 8, right? Jesus has come, sacrifice has been made. And, and Paul says this in second Corinthians 9, 8, he says, and God will generously provide all you need. Our God is an over-the-top giver. He is generous, right? He just provided in Exodus 12, right, for the people through the, the, peop the very people who had enslaved them. Uh, gold, silver, clothes, all that need, anything they asked for, they got. Awesome. So it wasn't just what they needed. They got more. <laughs> and it says, God will generously provide all you need. But look what it says. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to what? 
to share with others. So God, some versions say, God will give us an abundance for every good work. God gives us, an, if, you, if you're listening to this and you're in America, we live in a place of abundance, we do, and God takes care of our needs here plenty. But he also gives most, many of us abundance. Compared to the rest of the world, we have abundance. Listen, he's not saying hoard that, keep that for yourselves. He's saying use it to share with others, uh, for, uh, meet, meet others' needs, right? Ask God what you're supposed to do with it, right? Not just money, but your time, your talent, all of it, right? It's all God's, right? And so anyway, but he takes care of our needs. God's love does that. He meets our needs. Verse 47 of chapter 12 says the whole community of Israel must celebrate this Passover festival. So I just wanted to have that in there because again, I, I know he already said it once, but he's reminding them, don't forget this. Don't forget what I've done. Don't forget that, that I've brought you out of this 230 years of slavery, 400 years in Egypt. I, I've kept you so you could grow in this place, but now I'm gonna take you to a promised land. I, I'm gonna keep my covenant and my promise with you. Yes, I will, even though you've forgotten about it, most of you. Listen, I've got a plan and I'm working the plan with you. I'm setting you free today. And in verse 50, it says, so all the people of Israel followed all the Lord God's commands uh, to Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt like an army. Can you just envision it? <laughs> 1.5 to 2 million people exiting this country and going and following Moses. Ah, talk about a project. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I'm just logistics and all that. I don't even want to get into it, but I just, I'm just kind of blown away. And so here's my last point for today to wrap this up is that God's love crescendos in Jesus Christ. God's love crescendos in Jesus Christ. So I wanna, I wanna go from Exodus 12 to the New Testament. And I want, I want to just take a, a little chunk here from Romans 5 and I wanna just go through it and I want you to see how it ties to what we just read in Exodus. All right, so here it is, Romans 5, 6 to 11. When we were a new living, it says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. That's you and me, all right? We, we all are born into sin. Romans 3.23 says that. Everybody's sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Verse seven, now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though some might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. Oh, yeah, did I read that right? Yeah, let me read it again. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though some, one, might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. I guess if you're extra good, someone might be willing to die for you. But, right, that's radical. So it says this, why we were, why these few, first few verses here, why we were helpless, Christ came, Jesus dies for us, right? Stepping in, being the substitute, see how that ties back to the lamb, for someone who is, uh, not just for someone who is good, but for all of us. The scriptures say even when we were blind and dead in our sin, even when we didn't even acknowledge God, he died for us. Verse eight, but look at this, it says, but God showed his great love for us. How? By sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight, how? By the blood of Christ, by the blood of Christ. There's the connection with the blood. He, he atoned for our sins. He, he paid the price for our sins. God had to, there had to be blood shed. And, and a lamb, an animal, didn't take care of, it didn't take care of it completely. It, only, it was only a temporary uh, substitute. Jesus Christ is the permanent substitute because he's the perfect, sinless lamb of God. And it says he certainly will save us from God's condemnation. We, he, Jesus absorbed all of God's wrath. God is holy and perfect. And so uh, he, he can't stand in the midst of sinners without a, an atonement being made, a substitute. And Jesus stands in that gap and he pays the price for our sin. He took it upon himself. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's just radical. It's incredible. And so verse 10, for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies. Do you see that? God, rest God was restored by the death of his son. Our relationship or our friendship, it says, with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies. 
right? We're still, we didn't get it. God did it through Jesus before and says, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Verse 11. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. I, I love the New Living Translation here because it just uses the language of relationship and friendship in just a really easy to understand way. Listen, God didn't send Jesus to just rescue us from slavery only. That's a huge part of it. We were enslaved to sin and he sent Jesus to pay the penalty and the price that must be paid and it took his sacrifice, sacrificing his life and shedding his blood to pay the penalty, to be our substitute, right? But it doesn't stop there. He, he wants to restore, like take us back to what Adam and Eve had in the garden pre-sin with God walking in the garden, perfect fellowship, perfect relationship, a connection, a friendship with God. And through what Jesus Christ has accomplished, we can have that relationship. We can grow in that friendship with our God. It's personal. It's real. It's living. It's daily. Ah, not just rescue from death and destruction, but friends, friends to enjoy the King and his kingdom, friends to enjoy the abundant life here as well as eternal life with him in eternity. And wow, that, that's good news. I like that it says, rejoice in our wonderful new relationship. Ah, ah, you guys, maybe you've never said yes to Jesus. Maybe you've never surrendered your life to Christ. I wanna pray for you today. If you haven't, if you find your, you're like, Kevin, I, I feel like those, those Israelites that were stuck in Egypt, I wanna get free. I wanna exit out of that and go into a relationship with Christ. How do you do it? By faith. You receive it. You go, I need that. I, you don't earn it. You can't. You receive it like a gift. If you want that, pray with me. Lord Jesus, I just pray for anyone who's tuning in here today that's never said yes to you, never surrendered their life to you. Would you uh, just, if that's you, just say, yes, Jesus, I receive it. I, I receive it. That gift of love and grace and forgiveness and salvation, I receive it today in Jesus' name. And for those of us who, if you're tuning in here and you're like, Kevin, I, I find myself, you mentioned being stuck in dysfunction and and, and, and there's still, we can be saved, but God's still saving us. We can be, God can atone for our sins and we can be going to heaven. But while we're on this planet, he has things in us that he's transforming and changing. And so would you give him any of those areas of dysfunction, any of those areas of sin that you're wrestling with? You say, God, I, I've been given into this or given into this. I give it to you today. Forgive me. Just confess it to him. Just repent, which means turn from where you were going and back to him and just say, God, refresh me, empower me with your spirit. Lord, help me to walk connected with you in a fresh way today. Not just having the benefits of, of going to heaven, but enjoying the abundant life here, new life in you. Amen. I love you guys. Have a fantastic rest of your day. See ya. Thank you for joining our River City Family Worship Service today. Our prayer is for you to experience the mighty power and presence of God every single day through this week. If this was your first time with us, please text RCC New to 97000. And if you surrendered your life to Jesus for the first time, we are so excited and we want to know more. So please text RCC Life to 97000 as well. You can also stick around and chat with your online host. Let us know how your day's gone. Let us know how the service was. Have a great week.